from Los Angeles, California. That's right. We are tuned in from the West Angeles Church of God in Christ, where the bishop presiding, Bishop Charles Edward Blake, is the jurisdictional prelate, uh, actually our presiding prelate of the Church of God in Christ, former presiding our jurisdictional prelate of uh, California Southern First Jurisdiction, and he's also the proud pastor and founder uh, of this wonderful church. We're just glad to be here today. Um, we are so excited about this subject that we're going to be dealing with for the next few fleeting moments as God presents this uh, to us and shares this with us. Should all pastors and ministers be married? So here's what I need you to do. Here's what I need you to do. Everyone, everyone, everybody, I need you right now to share to like, to subscribe, to let someone know that we're on the air and we will be sharing the Word of God. Again, I praise God for this wonderful opportunity. We have just um, ended the homegoing celebration of the late Bishop James A. Lewis, who is uh, the uh, um, auxiliary bishop here in Southern California First Jurisdiction and, of course, was married for 57 years to our general supervisor, and that is none other than uh, Mother Barbara McCoo Lewis. And again, I'm honored and privileged, uh, President Opie. I was getting ready to leave. We enjoyed the wonderful service. We were leaving out, and our presiding bishop was in the hallway, and he said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm getting ready to go to do a webcast. He said, oh, you're not staying for the repast? And everybody looked at me and said, yeah, I think I'm staying for the repast. When the boss talks, uh, then you follow what the boss says. And so I'm so grateful and thankful for Presiding Bishop Blake making this possible for us to do the webcast right here from West Angeles, Church of God in Christ. The tech team is second to none. They got everything set up for me. Uh, colors may be just a little tad bit off because I'm not right directly up under the light, but nevertheless, I believe this lesson is going to be a blessing to so many people uh, because there are so many different ones. Bless you, Deacon Colts. Bless you, Thompson Temple, Church of God in Christ. Bless you, Atlanta Dream Style, Home, BC, as well as Top Realtor. So again, let's get directly into the Word of God, have some wonderful scriptures that we're going to be sharing with you. And the subject matter tonight is, should all pastors and ministers, should it be a requirement that they be married, that they have a spouse? Let's deal with that tonight. Let's pray and go directly into the Word of God. My first scripture is going to be coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 9. So, Father, I thank you right now for this glorious opportunity that you've afforded me to share the unsearchable riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for this ability to share the word across the country and around the world with so many different individuals. And I pray right now, dear God, for those that are in ministry, that you would touch them, help them, strengthen them, that we might continue to spread and to share this glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I thank you for already anointed me for this hour. You've already given me what to say. Now, anoint us not only to present it, but anoint us to receive it, and we'll give you the praise and glory, for we ask it all in Jesus' name, and all the people of God said, Amen. And so if you agree with that prayer, put Amen in the comment section, and do this for me right now. Get on the air, uh, get on the line, and tell someone that Tuesday Night Live is on the air, live and in living color, from Los Angeles, California, from the executive offices of the West Angeles Church of God in Christ. And again, I honor my uh, uh, presiding prelate, my presiding bishop, chief apostle, Bishop Charles Edward Blake, for allowing us to even have this opportunity to share uh, from the executive offices of his local church. Let's get into the topic tonight, and as we get into the topic, don't forget that Bible study is occurring in the next 45 minutes at Life Center Church of God in Christ, the church that I pastor, and uh, my wife and I celebrate and thank God for each and every one of you that were so kind to us. You don't have any sound? That were so kind to us during the, um, um, that may be your phone because it looks like everybody else. Periscope, if you got sound, say something. Um, it's always something with Periscope. But nevertheless, um, yeah, everybody say something if you can hear me because they're saying, okay, all right, you hear me. Thank you so much. So I think that's your phone. Uh, but 20 years, we celebrated 20 years this past Sunday. The wife and I 
uh, of the founding of the Life Center International Church of God in Christ. I'm excited about that. 20 years. Uh, this actually makes 25 years that I've been pastoring in the body of Christ, five years in Springfield, Missouri, and of course, uh, 20 years in St. Louis, Missouri. What a privilege and honor it has been. So thank you all uh, for helping to make the celebration wonderful. It was great. Um, and again, we're just looking forward to all of what God does in these next upcoming years. And of course, also we're getting ready for Holy Convocation. So don't forget that. You can go to Kojic.org and see all the information. But I need to get directly into this lesson because um, somebody really needs to hear this uh, tonight. Tonight the subject is, should all pastors and ministers uh, really, the topic should say be required to be married. Uh, you may remember in the old days in the church, they would say it's better to marry than to burn. Let's look at the scriptures and let's see what it specifically says. And um, 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9 says this, I say, therefore, to the unmarried, my notes over here, so that's why I'm looking on this side. I say to the unmarried and the widows, actually, I can hold it. It is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And it used to be a time years ago that people would say, hey, you know, just get married for that particular sake so that you won't fornicate, so that you won't commit adultery. And so we want to deal with that tonight because there's so many scandals that are taking place in the body of Christ. And so the question is, if we require pastors and leaders and ministers all to be married, would that alleviate all of the sin and all of the scandals that we are seeing so much in the body of Christ. My premise to you is basically this. If you're full of sin and lack self-control, just getting married is not going to change that. There needs to be a change in the heart. There needs to be a change in your life. The scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So it's important that people have a change of heart. Just getting married, or moving to another city, or pastoring another church, that's not going to change what's in here. There was one gentleman that I was uh, counseling at one time, and he had been married, I think this was like his fifth marriage that he was on. And so in this fifth marriage, oh, this lady this, and this lady that, and this woman this, and this woman that. And I told him, I said, now you've been married five different times, and you're the common denominator. So really, the issue is not with your spouse. The issue is with you. You've got some self-control problems. You, you have some sin problems in your life, and it's so easy to take the blame and point it to everyone else. I was talking with another individual. This wasn't pertaining to marriage, but just dealing with conflict resolution. And I said, I can count 35 different people that you've had conflicts with in the last 24 months. And the individual said, um, well, you know, I can point out in each case where it's all their fault. Listen, I know there's a lot of cases where the majority is wrong, but if you're in conflict with 35 different people, you really need to check yourself because, again, you are the common denominator. And so let's look through the scriptures and see, is it a requirement? Let's look at, I want us to look at the uh, patriarchs. I want us to look at the kings. I want us to look at the prophets. I want us to look at the life of Christ. Uh, I want us to look at the apostles and let's see as we answer this question, should it be a requirement? Would that stop so many of the scandals and specifically sexual scandals that are taking place? Now, here's what God said. God said this. God said in Genesis 2.18. Now, let me read the text because some people may think that's a conflict between Paul and um, between the Lord. But it says in Genesis 2.18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. So God himself said that it's not good for the man to be alone. Now, people will go to the scripture, um, like it says in 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9, where Paul says, I say to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them to abide even as I am. Paul had a gift of celibacy. That was a gift that he had. And he says, I wish that everybody was like me. I wish that everybody uh, would be in this particular state. He was really just stating his opinion in that particular case. The, the scripture doesn't contradict itself. You know, and if we think it contradicts ourself, itself, we just need to read a little bit further and see what the word is actually saying. Paul felt that it is better to, if you're in ministry, be able to focus if you're single because in, uh, yeah, thank you for your thoughts. I appreciate that, some of you sharing your thoughts. Uh, because you can focus more on ministry. You can focus more on what you have to do in upbuilding the kingdom of God. He said you can focus more basically on heavenly things versus earthly or temporal things. That seemed to work for him, but that's not going to work for everybody. 
in every particular case. And so he was sharing that. And that's a good thing about the scriptures. We try to take the Bible and just put it um, in a corner where, you know, this just simply means this. The Bible deals with every particular area and emotion of life and circumstance that you can possibly find yourself in. That word will deal with it. But the principle remains the same as what God said. And God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make and help me suitable for him. So from the scripture, so to answer our question, again, the question is, should pastors and uh, ministers be married? Now, and let me say this, as we look at the topic, I know that many of you have in your mindset just males, you know, but uh, there are females that are involved in ministry as well. And so this is really referring to everyone. Um, I, I know you say move a little bit. Well, if I move a little bit to this way, some of you are trying to give me some instructions. I may mess up on some of these other cameras. Let me back up this way. All right. Um, so, again, this is pertaining to everyone. To those that are giving me some instructions on the camera situation, I'm in um, a different setting tonight. I'm actually at West Angeles in the executive office. And so, and if I back up too far, I have my glasses off. I can't hardly see you, uh, what you're saying. So, uh, hopefully, if you can just kind of get what I'm saying from uh, right here. Um, so this really pertains to everyone because when we talk about um, sexual sins and scandals and things like that, the focus is always on males, but there's some ladies that need some deliverance as well, that need God to set them free uh, from sin, that need to be delivered from sin. And so basically, um, that's what we want you to understand, that it's a sin problem that needs to be dealt with. Just entering into a particular relationship or marriage is not going to deliver you from a flesh problem. If you have a flesh problem, that's why it's so important that we stay on the altar personally before God. I'm not just talking about in a church setting on a physical altar, but just in our prayer life, in our time with God. Just really focus on God work on me. And I like what a preacher said the other day. Matter of fact, it was Bishop Charles Patterson. For those of you that miss Bishop Patterson preaching at Life Center on Sunday, um, you missed a profound word. You missed a profound word. We don't, all, we don't really do a lot of live streaming. It's kind of hard to take a Pentecostal service and transcribe that to a uh, viewing audience because, um, you know, with the shouting, the rejoicing, I know that people put praise breaks and things like that on the line. But to me, that's something... Uh, sacred. It's not entertainment. When when we're dancing before God and giving God, giving vent to His uh, Spirit, it's not um, entertainment. And not saying that other people are just entertaining when they put it out there, but that's one reason why we just really don't do a lot of um, live streaming, just so we can just focus on giving God the glory, not trying to go viral with the praise break. But the man preached such a profound message, and one of the things that he was sharing in his message was that God is not an inventor. God is a creator. An inventor takes what's already created and makes something, but God takes nothing and makes something from it. And then he took that thought and went to the uh, 51st Psalm, where the psalmist said, create in me a clean heart. In other words, don't just take something that's already there and try to fix it, but create. Give me something totally brand new. And for those of you that may be struggling in your flesh, and it may not just be sexual sins, it could be some of anything. It could be talking too much. It could be eating too much. It could be all kinds of different habits and addictions and, and, and sins. That should be the prayer tonight is create in me a clean heart. In other words, all of this that's in me, it's just, it's just so far gone. I don't even want you to try to take the, I feel that right now. I don't even want you to try to take those pieces and put them together and make something. Just get rid of that all together. Just take that completely out. I mean, don't even just go down to the studs. Take the studs out, take the foundation out, lay a whole brand new foundation and build a whole brand new heart. Create in me a clean heart and renew it in me a right spirit. And that's what we should be praying. Somebody asked him, I speak. No, actually, this is um, Tuesday night. I'm here at West Angeles, but um, uh, not speaking tonight. But nevertheless, that should be our desire if you're struggling in any particular area. And what's so bad about uh, sometimes dealing with ministry is this. You don't have people that you can confide in. You don't have people all the time that you can go to and say, hey, I need some help. I need prayer. I need deliverance. I need some encouragement. Ministry can be one of the most lonely fields. And I don't say that complaining. 
because when I was talking Sunday morning about 20 years pastoring Life Center, I said, I don't have a hard luck story. I can't get up here and sing the blues to you and talk about how bad it is. I hear some pastors just, when you hear them talk about pastoring, I don't get any rest and I don't have vacations and the people take all my time and I don't have any money. That's why Jesus said, count up the cost. You got to count up the cost before you get into this. You got to count up the cost and know what you're getting into. And that's why I thank God that through my legacy and heritage, I've you know been around pastoralship all of my life. And I saw and I knew I saw the price that is paid. And so when I said yes to God, I said yes to the, <laughs> I hate to say this, but to the good, the bad, the ugly, the unexplainable, the unmentionable, the, the valleys, the mountains and everything else. So realize this, when you get into ministry, know what you're getting into. Don't just get into ministry just because, you know, I, I just want to preach to the masses. I want to preach to the multitude. There is a price to pay with ministry. You don't have a lot of friends. You don't have a lot of people that you can confide in, you know, and so for a lot of ministers, I think that's one reason why you see so many uh, scandals is because of a lack of accountability. See, with accountability, there's trust, and with trust, there's camaraderie, and you don't always have that camaraderie. You don't always have that togetherness. You know, you, you confide to another minister that you're going through and you feel like giving up, and they may get excited about that. Oh, if your church breaks up, then I can take all your members, and I can, you know, move. So, so it's real treacherous. It can be very treacherous, but that's why you really, yeah, and it's not a business opportunity either. You're not getting into ministry just as, you know, well, there's nothing else I can do. Let me do this, and that's how I'm going to make a living. It's not just about making a living. There is a cost. So understand, there's a loneliness with this, but you're the one that said yes to God. And when you say yes to God, you're saying yes to holding up the standard. You're saying yes to living the life. You're saying yes to being consecrated. You're saying yes to dealing with frustration and disappointments and things like that. So if you have to get somewhere, just you and God, and ask God to deal with those particular areas of your life, do it. Do it. Because you know what? Once you say yes, that's the point of no return. Once you say yes to God, uh, brother minister, sister evangelist, once you say yes to God, that's the point of no return. Jesus said, no man putting his hand to the plow and then looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He said, you, you're not even fit to make it in. You're not even fit to be a part of the culture. You're not even fit to walk around with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you, you don't even meet the standard if you put your hand to the plow and then you turn and look back. When we say yes, we really mean yes. A lot of people sing yes because that's the theme song of the Church of God in Christ. That's the national anthem. Bishop Mason used to sing it. But listen, it is a song of consecration and total consecration. Total consecration, total separation, total dedication. And I'm telling you, you can't look back. Yeah, there may come a time that you have to retire. In the future, I'm going to retire and all of that. That doesn't mean you retire from ministry. You may retire from certain offices and positions and pastoralship and things like that. Uh, but you're still in ministry. And when you say yes to God in ministry, that's the rest of your life. You know, be thou faithful until death. And I will give you a crown of life. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. So let me challenge every preacher that is listening here. You know, we have a world to win. We have a world to evangelize. Not only is the church looking at us, the world is looking at us. And to many in the world, the church has become totally irrelevant altogether. And in order for us to remain relevant, we must be totally dedicated to the work of the Lord. Mind, body, soul, spirit, motive, intent, outside, inside, what people can see, what they cannot see. And so once we're consecrated and dedicated and hold up that bloodstained banner, then God can really do what he desires to do through us. Come on, aren't you ready to see what, what, what we read about in the book of Acts? The book of Acts, Acts does not have any ending. At chapter 28, you know, it's totally different from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and other books. When you go to those other books of the Bible, uh, you'll find a definite ending. You find the Great Commission in Matthew. You find the Great Commission in Mark. You find Jesus giving a goodbye in Luke. And, uh, and John, you have him talking to Peter and all these different things. But in Acts, it's, it's almost like a cliffhanger. It doesn't end. And the reason why it does not have a definite ending 
is because um, uh, uh, be, be, because that the work continues even until this time. The work continues to this time. Somebody just asked a question, why would a pastor retire in good health? Well, one reason is this, you know, finishing your course of destiny. That's what I want to see everybody do. I want everybody to be like Paul. I fought a good fight. I finished my course and I've kept the faith. That's what you want to do is finish your course. But you never want to be to the point that you build something up and then you tear something down. When I get to the point, and let me just say this to you all, and I, that's a whole different lesson that we can deal with um, in another time. But I definitely want to say this. When I get to the point that I can't use restroom myself, you know, I can't, you know, take care of myself and all of that. Well, that's the time to really definitely um, um transfer and, and somebody else that you've mentored, give that to them so that the work can continue. I know that we say we need to stay in, you know, with pastor church until we pass on, but again, there's so much more to ministry than what we think about. We think ministry is just behind the pulpit. Mentoring is ministry. Preparing the next generation is 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 ministry. Training people is ministry. Sharing your experiences with other people, not just the good times. How many of you have ever been in seminars before and a person will tell you, well, I started pastoring in March and then by April I had 20, you know, 20,000 people attending the church, but you never hear about the good, bad, and the ugly. That's why I appreciate the ministry of uh, Presiding Bishop Blake. And even as he talked today, uh, so, so those of you that did not get a chance to um, view the webcast of the funeral, go back and listen to the message. It's a very encouraging message and Bishop Blake talks about you know those times when you didn't have the huge two or three cathedrals and all that in 25,000 members he talked about the time where there wasn't a whole lot of money and and when you went out to eat it was you know if you went out to eat it was jack in the box you know that was considered the expensive restaurant to go to jack in the box and so you can relate to something like that where somebody has labored somebody has struggled they've gone through the difficult times they've gone through the good times and all of that and so those are things that can be passed on so that's what i want to see that's my heart's desire. My prayer to God for each and every one of you that are involved in ministry, that you would finish your course and you would finish it with dignity, that you would go through your course of ministry, that you would finish your assignment, that you would make it to the finish line and can look back and have no reason to hold your head down. Well, does that mean we got to be absolutely, positively, totally perfect and no faults and everything like that? Listen, I, the only person I know like that is Jesus. But let me tell you this. I do have the promise from the Word. And for everyone that is struggling, everyone dealing with habits, everyone like I'm really, really trying, Ankerson, and I just can't do it, the Word says, now unto Him, hallelujah, that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power. That is the promise from the word and you've got to hold God to his word. You can't do it in yourself. You can't stand within yourself but with the grace of God. And listen, let me say this. Let me say this. There are some of you that may argue with me theologically about this but when we talk about should all pastors ministers be required to be married and would that keep people from so many sexual sins and scandals and things like this let me tell you what's going to keep you from that not just getting married is going to keep you from that let me tell you what's going to keep you from that you need to be baptized in the holy ghost and i'm not just talking about just running someplace and getting picking up some kind of tongues that you heard somebody preach because you know, people are so quick just to want the tongues. It's not about the tongues. Those people in the upper room, they waited on God. And they waited on God for 10 days, and God filled them with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter was totally transformed. If you really want to live this life, if you really want to be the minister that God has called you to be, my brother, my sister, you need to be baptized in the gift of the Holy Ghost according to the Word of God. That's what you have to do. I'm right now in Los Angeles, California, not too far from me right now. If you go into downtown Los Angeles, there's a place called 312 Azusa Street. Not too far from that, there's another address, 214 Bonnie Bray Street. And that is the place, April the 9th, 1906, 
right here in the city of Los Angeles, April the 9th, 1906, 214 Bonnie Bray Street, that the power of the Holy Ghost fell and the Pentecostal movement began to spread across the country and around the world. That was a house at Bonnie Bray Street. As a matter of fact, the house is still there. It's owned by California Southern First Jurisdiction. And so if you go a few blocks over, you can get to 312 Azusa Street. And that's the place where they moved the meeting to. And the people would seek God. And it wasn't just about the tongues. Because what ends up happening now, people, ha ba 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 sha, I got it. Oh, ba 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 licious, ha ba 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 licious, ha ba 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 licious. You know, um, and, and all of that. And oh, I got it, I got it. But but then, <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no other kind of fruit that goes along with it. It's the fruit of the Spirit and not just speaking with other tongues. There at Azusa Street, right here in Los Angeles, California, not too far from where I am right now. Um, there at Azusa Street, they they would do what's called tearing, and we've got that all mixed up, and people fight tearing and say, oh, you don't need all of that. Probably another way of phrasing that is this. Maybe that's the wrong terminology. Um, maybe that's the wrong terminology, because Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and tarry until you be endowed with power from on high. He meant wait, and the reason why he meant wait was because the power of the Holy Ghost, according to Joel chapter 2, uh, had not occurred yet, not until the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, then the Spirit of God was poured out. He said, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Um, so maybe tearing is not the best word to use. I do believe in tearing uh, for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But when we say tearing, we're not saying, in other words, you got to wait to get something that God already has available. He's ready to fill you with the Holy Ghost right now. But maybe a better term to use is waiting on God, lingering in the presence of God, staying in God's presence until God conditions our heart and transforms our heart and takes out of us things that do not belong there. And that takes time. I know we're in a time now with 90-minute services once a week. You know, I, I have no issue, no problem with that. I don't believe in wasting a lot of time in a worship service. But if you really want God to condition that heart, so that you save, sanctified, baptized, and feel whether you uh, are married or not. It takes lingering and spending time in the presence of God where God can condition that heart and remove those things that are not like him. Let me give you a story. Uh, and this happened right here in Los Angeles, 312 Azusa Street. There was a gentleman named G.B. Cashwell. G.B. Cashwell, that was his initials. Cashwell was the last name. And he was the leader of the Pentecostal Holiness Church. And so he was a white gentleman, Caucasian. And so he came to Los Angeles. He'd heard about what uh, was going on at Azusa Street. I mean, people were coming here from all over the world. C.H. Mason came and, and others with him uh, to see all about what God was um, doing. So nevertheless, G.B. Cashwell came, and the first service that he was in, he was totally disgusted. He just was completely turned off. And the reason why he was turned off was because he was from the South, and there was the Jim Crow laws, and that's just the way that things were. And so coming to Azusa Street, it was a mixed worship service, a mixed worship experience, people from all different cultures and all kind of different backgrounds. And so nevertheless, he saw black people tearing over white people to receive the Holy Ghost. He said, oh, no. He said, no way, no how. If that's what has to happen for me to get the Holy Ghost, I guess I'm not going to get it. And so he left. And when he left, he went back to his room, and God dealt with him, and God showed him. He said, I'm not going to feel you, and you will not experience the fullness of my spirit until you get out of your heart that hatred for black people. And so he cried out to God, God, tearing. So in other words, you could call it waiting on God. In the Pensacola outpouring, they called it soaking. Um, you know, maybe we need to come up with some kind of biblical term, but the best term that the saints could use from the Bible in those days was tearing. And so he waited upon God. He waited upon God, cried out to God until God sanctified him down to the bone, ran into the service at Azusa Street, shocked everybody, ran into the service on Azusa Street and said, I want a black person to lay hands on me so that I can be filled with the Holy Ghost. And according to his faith, it happened. And that black person laid hands on him, and he ended up getting filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, and went back south, preaching and going on his way, rejoicing and magnifying God. That's what it's going to take.
still with me? Okay, yeah, thank God you're still with me. Um, there are so many that have said, well, it doesn't take all of that anymore. It still takes waiting in the presence of God. If you're still with me, put that in the comment section. We, we be here, like, like they said in the book of Acts. Well, don't, that's bad English, but just say we are here. So it, that's what it takes. If it took that then, it's going to take it now. So again, to answer that question, should, should all pastors and ministers uh, uh, be married? Well, according to the Word of God, the Scripture says it's not good for man to be alone. But I will tell you this, just getting married is not going to deliver you from your sin. Uh, yeah, he said this ain't time to be freezing up. So if he froze up once, hopefully everything is straight now. This, you know, the, what, what you have to understand is the heart has to be right. That's what's going to do it. Your heart has to be right. So please stay in the presence of God to you ministers and pastors and leaders that are watching. And you may say, well, how long do I got to stay? Well, let me give you another story. Uh, the late Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, founder of the Church of God in Christ, many times would come into, um, it's freezing, but here, okay, good, 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 good. Is it freezing over and over? If it's freezing over and over again, then I will turn the um, Wi-Fi off and just use, uh, but they got some of the strongest Wi-Fi in the nation here right now. I'm going in and out. Hold on a second, saints, because I don't want you all to miss what I'm saying. Uh, it keeps freezing. Hold on, because there's some things that I want to say to you. Um, just let me know if it's getting better. Let me know if it's getting better. Let me know if it's getting better, because it looks better on my end right now. Um, but again, with the hunger for the supernatural, this is what I want to say. That is the key. And you may ask the question, how long? The story I was going to tell was about Bishop Mason. Um, he would come in sometimes, have people praying three and four and five hours. And one day they were down on their knees and it was about three hours they'd been praying. And um, somebody was sitting there saying, Lord, have mercy. Jesus, my knees are hurting. Uh, be received, you, you, you will receive it. Now, looking at the scriptures, all the patriarchs were married. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's son, sons, as well as Job. All of them were married, okay? So when you study the scriptures, you'll find all of your patriarchs were married. So in answering the question, we, we want to just look back for a few minutes and see all the different men of God and leaders and people of God that God used and see what happened with them, and that'll kind of give us a pattern. And so, looking at the pattern, again, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's sons, as well as Job. Now, somebody may say, okay, good, it's getting better. Somebody said, well, why would, why would you mention Job? Actually, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It was written, actually, before Genesis, but the events in the book of Genesis occurred long before the book of Job. But your oldest book in the Bible is actually Job. So that's why we include him with the patriarchs. So all of them were married, all right?
the establishment of the nation with Moses and with Aaron and even with the establishment of the priesthood, these individuals were married. And as far as we know, most of the prophets were married as well. Isaiah was married, Isaiah 8 and 3. And he says, I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, call his name Maharshalal Hashbaz. Ooh, Hankerson, you pronounce that name real good. Guessing just like everybody else. But nevertheless, Isaiah was married. Hosea, we know, was married. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore a son. Now when you look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah was forbidden to marry. It says, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, Jeremiah 16 and 2, neither shalt thou have sons and daughters in this place. So looking at our pattern, the patriarchs, all of them were married, the establishment of the nation, those individuals. married because of course he is the son of God he came into this world and then he was ascend and leave this world so there really wasn't any need so Mark 6 and 3 says isn't this the carpenter isn't this Mary's son the brother of James Joseph Judas and Simon it was not like they said forget my kids forget my wife let me just go on and do about ministry what it literally meant was to totally give themselves over to following Christ all right so looking at that let's go back again patriarchs all of them married. Priests, they could get married. Most likely, most of them were. Um, prophets, uh, most of them most likely were married. And then now, let's look at the Apostle Paul. Paul was not married. And he says there in 1 Corinthians 7 and 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them even to abide as I. So as I stated, um, looking at this, is pretty bad now and it keeps freezing okay so I'm sorry for those of you that is freezing you can go to Instagram you can go to Periscope or you can go to my fan page and it's not freezing there so I'm sorry what I don't want to do is switch off and go and try to switch to another network and then all of a sudden I lose everybody alright so um, please forgive me for that techn technological difficulty tonight this is really showing us that there is no hard answer that we can give on every minister being married or not because many individuals were and many were not. So again, let's look at our question. Should all pastors and ministers be required to be married? According to the scriptures, there is no one hard set answer that we can give yes or no. In the passages of scripture that we looked at, at many of the Bible personalities, many, probably I could say the majority were, and then there were some that were not. Okay, so there is no set particular set answer. But again, I'm going to say this, and this is the premise of the lesson too. If you have habits that are ungodly, if you have sins that need to be broken in your life, just getting married is not going to change what's in here. You've got to deal with what's in here, because if you don't deal with what's in here, you're going to mess up a marriage. You're going to mess up a family. You're going to mess up your kids. And it's going to be something worse than you can ever imagine. It's one thing for you to be a mess, but then to cause a catastrophe with so many other people. I would say get yourself together first. Get your heart right first. Get your life together first before you talk about trying to link up with somebody else so you don't uh, mess up their life. So will getting married cause scandals to decrease? Biblical marriage would definitely cause some accountability. However, marriage will not remove sin from the human heart. Married or not, a minister must have self-control. Put that in the comment section. A minister must have self-control. 
Uh, Taino's Best over here says nobody in any religious organization should require anyone to be married. It's none of their nosy business. Well, you really got a good, you actually have a good point, you know, because we get so much into folks' business that we'll even try to tell people who to marry. And be careful with that. Don't don't let somebody prophesy to you, God showed me that that's your spouse. He ain't showed you. Something is wrong with that biz, with, with that um, uh, setup. And I agree with you that really, nosiness is not a part of holiness. You can put that in the comment section. Nosiness is not a part of holiness. But beside from that, every minister must have self-control. If a person is uh, does not... Um, uh, if a person does not, the reason I'm looking at this is a pretty strong statement I have in my notes. It says here, if a person doesn't have self-control, you don't belong in the ministry. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing, the problem nowadays, we've made ministry a right and not a privilege. I remember when I started driving at the age of 15, I went to driver's ed. And in driver's ed, they taught me, they said driving is a privilege and not a right. And just like you have received this privilege, this privilege can also be taken away from you. We have made ministry almost a right where everybody can just jump up. I don't know any other field. You can't do it in medicine. Um, you can't do it in law. You can't do it in education. You can't do it in science. You can't do it in government. You can't just jump up and just say, hey, I'm this because God made me this. Um, but in ministry, it seems like everybody can just jump up. All right, God told me that I'm this. God told me that I'm that. And so that's how it is. And no accountability. If you don't have self-control, then the ministry is not the field for you. Ministry is a privilege, and it's not a right. And it shouldn't be open up to in and everybody. I strongly believe in that. It shouldn't be open up to everybody. I even believe, let me say this, and that's a whole different lesson altogether, but let me just make this statement parenthetically. I believe that you should be strong mentally to be able to handle ministry. Hankerson, are you saying if somebody's mentally ill that they cannot be in ministry? I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this, you really have to count up the cost. There is an emotional toll that takes place in ministry, and if you are not a strong individual. I know we say be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I understand that. But you've got to be strong as a person as well. You've got to be strong as an individual as well. If not, you can end up crumbling up under the pressure. And so I believe people should really count up the cost before entering into ministry. Here's what the scripture says about self-control. Proverbs 25, 28, like a city whose walls are broken down is a person who lacks self-control. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such there is no law. So this goes back to what I was saying about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And thank you all for the numbers coming back up. I know that you all had so much trouble with this uh, freezing and everything like that, but you all are so dedicated. I thank God for all of my Tuesday night viewers and followers. You are dedicated, and if it goes in and out, you make sure you either get back on or you go. I see some of you jumping on some of the other um, um, contraptions that were. I say contraptions because you can't see, but it's actually contraptions. Um, Instagram, you know, Periscope. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. The fan page. Um, as well. But it goes back to what I said. The baptism of the Holy Ghost. Kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Now that's what the scripture says. Now in the Hankerson version, let me give you the Hankerson version. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is not just talking in tongues, but it's having self-control. It's having the fruit of the Spirit. It's having the character of Christ. We have mastered the speaking in tongues. We're, the body of Christ is almost like the Corinthian church. He said, Paul said on, in one instance he was trying to take up the offering. He said, now you all do good in, in spiritual things and utterances and all of that. I want you to do good in this also. So we got talking in tongues down, down packed. I mean, we know how to roll our tongues. You know, I mean, we know how to sound deep in those tongues. Um, we know how to talk to each other in tongues. I saw two people, two women in church one time. I think they cussed each other out in tongues because one wanted the other one to move. The other one wanted the other one to move. And this one looked at this one, ha ba ba sha ta. And the other one looked, he bo sha na. I said, oh, wait a minute, they are not talking.